Hi everyone, I'm Nick Olivo, and today we're doing an overview of the D&D 5th edition character sheet for Roll20. And the idea here is that if you're a DM who has a new player, maybe they're new to D&D, or maybe they're just new to D&D on Roll20, this video should give them a good understanding of where everything lives on their character sheet and how it works, so that when game day rolls around, they'll be able to navigate their character sheet with confidence. And I'm going to put a link down in the video description with a timestamp that will take that player right to the spot in the video where we start, so you can just share that with them and then they'll be good to go. Before we dive in, I'd just like to thank Roll20 for sponsoring this video. So let's get you acquainted with your character sheet. And in this video, we're going to show you how to make attack rolls and damage rolls. We'll see how to do spells. We'll see how to do saving throws. We'll how to do skill checks, as well as a few other things along the way. Let's dive in. Now, you probably already know that you can open your character sheet by going to the journal tab and then clicking on your character sheet here. But you can also open your character sheet by holding down the Alt key and double clicking on your character's token. That'll bring up your character sheet and now we can resize it and begin performing whatever actions we need to do. Now let's say that our character, Jayla, is in combat with these two goblins. When combat breaks out, the first thing your DM is going to ask you to do is roll initiative. So what they'll do is open up this turn order window and then they will roll initiative for your bad guys. So you can see here that our DM has rolled initiative for the bad guys, and just so you know, if you hover over an entry in the turn order window, it will highlight which bad guy that represents. Now we wanna add our own initiative to the turn order window, so what you wanna do is click on your character's token, and then click the initiative link right here in the top center portion of your character sheet. You'll notice now that the chat tab in our right hand panel has lit up and that means that we're seeing the roles that have been made. So we're going to click back to that panel and this is where we're going to see all the other activities that take place during the course of this combat. Once everyone has rolled initiative, our DM will sort the turn order window so that the character with the highest initiative goes first. And as you can see, we've got the two goblins and then our character Jayla. So at this point, the first goblin is going to advance on Jayla and is going to attack her with its short sword. So it makes it swing, and we can see right here that the goblin rolled a 15 for its attack. And now our DM is going to say, does a 15 hit you? So you can look over here at your armor class value, and they need to roll your armor class value or higher in order to hit you. So you say, yes, a 15 hits because our armor class is 15. And that means that the goblin just dealt eight piercing damage to us. So what we can do is we can deduct eight from this value right here. So 40 minus eight is 32. We would enter that. And now we've just adjusted our HP. Incidentally, if I set this back to 40, you can also adjust the HP directly via these bubbles right here. This center one is your HP. You can actually just type in minus eight and then Roll20 does the math for you. And personally, I like to do that because then it's just less math I need to do. Okay, so now the next goblin is going to take its turn and this goblin has an ability called Psychic Stab. And what the Psychic Stab ability means is that the target, in this case Jayla, needs to make an intelligence saving throw. And so to make a saving throw, you're gonna go to this panel right here and just click on intelligence. And so you can see we rolled a four, which is a fail because we needed a 12. So that means we're going to take another seven points of damage. And again, we can just deduct that right here from the bubbles in our token. Now you may be wondering why we rolled twice here, why we have a four and a 21. So that's for when you are rolling with either advantage or disadvantage. In D&D 5th edition, if circumstances favor your character, then you may be able to roll with advantage, which means that you roll twice and you take the higher number. So if our DM had told us we were making this intelligence save with advantage, then we would take the higher number, the 21, in which case we would have succeeded. 
if we were in a situation where we had to roll with disadvantage, then we would roll twice and take the lower number. But in this situation, we're not rolling with advantage or disadvantage, we're just making a regular roll. And in those cases where you're just making a regular roll, you always use the number on the left because that represents your first roll. And in this situation, it's the only roll. So we have failed the intelligence save, we've taken the damage, and now it's our turn. So now we decide that we want to attack the goblin that came up and stabbed us earlier. So what we're going to do is go to the attacks and spell casting section of our character sheet right here. And this will list out all of the attacks that you can make. So let's say I want to try to hit this goblin with my mace. I can click on the mace entry in the attacks and spell casting table. And you can see that just like before, we've made two rolls in case this was an advantage or disadvantage situation. But again, it's not, so we're just gonna take the number on the left, and I'll ask my DM, does a 15 hit? And the DM says, yes, a 15 hits. So now I want to roll damage. And the way you roll damage is just by clicking on the name of the attack right here in the chat window. So we click that and we can see that I did seven bludgeoning damage to that goblin. My DM then tells me that that is enough damage to kill the goblin and marks it as dead on the board. My turn is now over, so the DM advances. The goblin that would go next is now dead, so we skip to the other one. This goblin again would advance and would make an attack with its scimitar. We see it rolled a 20, which beats my armor class of 15 and deals five points of slashing damage to me. And now it's my turn again. And this time around, let's cast an attack spell rather than using our mace. So what I'm gonna do is cast Moonbeam just by clicking on it here. And you can see we get a box asking, what level do you want to cast the spell at? Some spells can be cast using a higher level spell slot to do more damage or to grant additional effects. For right now, we're just gonna keep the default level of level two. So we're gonna say submit. And then down here, we can see the goblin needs to make a DC 14 constitution save, which they have failed. So they will take all 14 points of this radiant damage and that will be enough to kill them. Now, because I've used a spell slot to cast that Moonbeam, I need to track that, and I can track it by going to the Spells tab here in my character sheet. And you can see here that Moonbeam is a level two spell. I currently have two level two slots available. I've spent one of them, so I'm just going to deduct this down so there's only one remaining. Now, quick aside here, your DM may have some sort of automated mechanism in place to deduct spell slots for you. You can ask them if they do, in which case you don't need to do this step, but I'm assuming that they don't. So you will need to come in here and track when you've used a spell slot after casting a spell. Incidentally, while we're on this tab, I should mention that this is where you can see your spell save DC which will be displayed when you cast the spell, but there may be times when your DM asks you, hey, what's your spell save DC again? You can come in here and you can see it on the spells tab. Now, if you're playing a character that can change spells out after a long rest, like a cleric, like Jayla is, I want her to have healing word when we have our next long rest. So what I can do is click on the compendium icon on the top right here, and then I can search for the spell healing word, here it is, and now I can literally just drag it right from the sidebar onto my character sheet. And you can see it's added it right here. Now, what I like to do is mark those spells that are domain spells with a red dot, and that way I know that those are always prepared for my cleric, as opposed to those other spells which I've just chosen for that particular day. And if you want to remove a spell because your character doesn't know it that day, like here I'm preparing Healing Word instead of Cure Wounds, you can click this little lock icon and then click the trash can icon next to Cure Wounds and then that's removed from your character sheet. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. You could just remember that you've got Healing Word prepared today rather than Cure Wounds. But me personally, I like to always just have those spells that I have available to me for the day. Once that's done, if we go back to the core tab, we'll see that Healing Word now shows up in our attacks and spell casting section. And we could cast that if we wanted to, to get some hit points back. So let's go ahead, let's do that. We'll cast Healing Word at level one, go back to the chat section, 
and we recover five hit points, so we'll bump this up to 25. You may also want to roll hit dice in order to recover hit points as part of a short rest. And to do that, just click on the hit dice link right here. And that will roll your hit dice for a cleric. It's a D8 and add your constitution modifier automatically. So again, we recovered four more hit points, which puts us back up to 29. And I would mark that I'd use another hit die. And now I have one out of my five remaining for a future heal later on. So that handles most of the actions you'll be performing in combat. Now let's talk about some of the other pieces of your character sheet like skills, features and traits, and your inventory. Skill checks work just the same as attacks and saves do. You're gonna go to this panel here on your character sheet and let's say that your DM has asked you to make a religion check to identify the holy symbol that the goblin is carrying. You just click on religion and then you can see, just like before, you've got two rolls being made for the advantage and disadvantage situation. Again, we're not making it with either, so our roll would just be this nine, and the DM would tell us if that had succeeded or failed. Over here in this section of the, your character sheet are resources that your character may have access to. For example, Jayla is a Twilight Cleric, which means she has an ability called Eyes of Night that allows her to give dark vision to other creatures, and she can do that once. So when she's used that, we can deduct that and say that she has zero uses of that ability remaining. Same thing with her channel divinity and any other resources she has access to. If we scroll down here, we can see a list of all the features and traits that Jayla has. And if you want, you can view those just by clicking on their title. So what does Vigilant Blessing do? It means that you can give another creature advantage on initiative rolls. You can close that up. If you tell the DM, hey, I want to use Vigilant Blessing, and they say, what does that do again? You can click on the word bubble icon right here and that will send the description of Vigilant Blessing into the chat. This cog would allow you to edit the text of the Vigilant Blessing ability, which you probably don't want to do. Just leave it as it is by default. This section here lists out all the equipment that your character is carrying. So here we can see they have two rations and each of those rations weigh two pounds. So if our character has a meal and we reduce this by one, we'll see the total weight go down from 81.3 pounds to 79.3 pounds. So your character's encumbrance is calculated automatically. Additionally, let's say you go shopping and you want to buy something new. You can go over to the compendium tab, search for the item that you're buying. So let's look for ball bearings because those are an awesome piece of equipment to have. You can click on the link here to view the description of what ball bearings are all about and how they work. And if you decide you want to buy them, and your DM will let you, you can just drag them right on to the character sheet and that will add them to your inventory, automatically adjust the weight, and then you can reduce the total amount of money that you have by the appropriate amount. So ball bearings cost one gold, I'll just reduce this down to 14. This panel lists out any other proficiencies you may have, like what armor you're proficient with, what kind of weapons you're proficient with, and what languages you speak. And then up here are your tool proficiencies if you have any. So if you were someone who could use, say, thieves tools or a disguise kit, those would be listed here. And at some point during the game, the DM may ask you what your passive perception is. That's right here, the passive wisdom perception score. So that covers pretty much all of the basics. But there are a couple of other things I want to show you that will help make life easier as you play. And the first of those things are called global modifiers. There are times in a game where you're going to roll another die in addition to your typical roll. For example, the bless spell, you add a d4 to your attack rolls and saving throws. So rather than making your attack roll and then adding another die roll after the fact, you can actually incorporate that bless die roll automatically. And the way we do that is by going up here to the cog. And in this column, you're going to see that there is a field called show global attack modifier field and show global save modifier field. And with those boxes checked, when we go back to core, you'll see now that we have a global save modifier right here with bless already populated and a global attack modifier here already with bless populated in it. And so what that means now is when we make an attack roll with this box checked, like I'll swing with my mace here, 
And we can see now here's our 18, that's our normal roll, and then plus two, which is coming from bless. Same thing here with the global save modifier, right? We have the bless right there. If I make a wisdom save, we can see I have rolled an 18 again and I added a one. So that would give me a 19 for my save overall. And then once the bless spell has worn off, you just uncheck these boxes. And now when you make another attack roll or saving throw, it doesn't include the bless roll anymore. The final thing I want to mention is leveling up. So when your character hits a particular experience point threshold or when they hit a particular milestone, your DM will tell you, hey, congratulations, you've leveled up. You can click on this little button right here, which will invoke the character mancer, and that's the wizard that will walk you through advancing your character. If that little icon doesn't appear, what you can do is click on the cog again, scroll down, and then say launch level and character mancer and that takes you into the exact same wizard and you're good to go. So there you have it. That's how you can get around on the D&D 5th edition character sheet. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a like and consider subscribing and be sure to share it with your new players. Until next time, folks, thanks for watching and have a great day.